So I'm very happy to be back in Vancouver. I enjoy your city very much. Been here a few times. Met some of you, not all of you. And we have such a long time together this evening. It'd be nice uh, if we could do some meditation as well as lecture and discussion. On some level, just talking about Buddhism and talking about meditation you know, makes about as much sense as talking about swimming and never actually getting in the water. And meditation, uh, you know, talking about it isn't going to really help any of us other than maybe inspire us to do it. So I like when we get together to actually do it, to actually meditate together. And so we'll do that some tonight. Tonight's topic I threw out there for our discussion is breaking the addiction to our minds. I did that partially because of the orchard's support of my trip up here and this sort of integration of recovery from addiction and spiritual practice. And because I really believe that this is the core message of Buddhism. That the core message of Buddhism is transforming our relationship to our minds and bodies in this world. And one way of looking at that is seeing how addicted we are as the human species and culture. How, how addicted we are to pleasure. This is the Buddha's description of the cause of all suffering, sometimes called craving, could be called addiction. The second noble truth. That it's a craving or for things to be other than the way that they are. A craving for life to be more pleasant. Craving for life to be less painful. that creates the extra layer of suffering in our lives. Human suffering based on what we could call addiction to pleasure and hatred of everything else. Pain, boredom, serenity, peace, most of us find ourselves in a human condition that is so uh, focused on intense stimulation that anything less than intense is unsatisfactory by nature. Does this seem true to you? You see the noble truth and how we create difficulties for ourselves? And addiction to our minds, right? We're addicted to thinking, addicted to planning. Spend so much of our lives Worrying about the future, planning the future, craving for the future to be a certain way. All in this mental fantasy world, completely missing the present time experience of actually how it is, rather than how we want it to be. Or the opposite, you know, all of this thought, world, life that we spend in the past. Our minds replaying old stories, old resentments, old fears, or old pleasant memories. But from a Buddhist perspective, it's just the way it is. We are born into a physical, 
situation that is a survival-based mentality. And that our survival-based mentality, our wiring, is one of craving. Is one of craving for pleasure. In order to survive, we have to crave for pleasure. In order to survive, we have to be what we could call addicted to pleasure. If we weren't, we wouldn't procreate. We wouldn't get out of the way of the bus when it was coming. We wouldn't pull back from the hot flame when we were getting burned. All right, so it's just very basic biological truth that the, that the Buddha is pointing to. This isn't even spiritual. This is just scientific psychology. It's just the way it is. And it works fine for survival. Of course, the problem with our addiction, with our craving, is the way that it causes so much personal difficulty in our lives. And the way that this craving for pleasure and aversion of pain, as the Buddha puts it, the forces of greed, hatred, and delusion. And the greed that is craving for pleasure, that's greed, it's lust. It's built into us. And the hatred, which is the aversion to pain, the denial, the suppression, the attempt to avoid anything unpleasant or boring or not intense. Now these forms of greed and hatred so subtle in the human being, for the most part subtle within us, although constant, in their extremes create every form of oppression in this world. Create every war, every corrupt politician, every confused parent, every power-hungry person is coming from that same thing that we each have, that we all have, that all human beings have, which is a survival-based mentality, a craving for pleasure. A craving, we could even say, for happiness. But that there's a delusion to the causes of happiness. There's a confusion about the path to happiness. And that if we never really pay attention deeply, of course, through meditation is my idea about how we pay attention, deeply, that if we don't do it, then we become part of the norm in this world. The norm of, I want to get ahead at any cost. And it doesn't matter how many people I hurt in the process, as long as my desires are met, my greed. Which has caused every form of sexist, racist, Ageist, religionist, oppression in this world. All comes from that greed for power, that greed for pleasure, and that confusion about I'll be happy when I get. And it never, ever works. But the norm is to be addicted to that mentality, that confused, survival-based mentality that causes all of these personal and societal and global problems. The Buddha's teaching is clearly about breaking our identification with that craving, transforming our relationship 
to pleasure and to pain, to power and wealth. And seeing more, uncovering more, what could be said is really within each one of us. What some Buddhists have termed Buddha nature. That through a radical form of internal rebellion that we call meditation, transforming our relationship to pleasure and pain, to power, and to rewiring our heart and our mind so that we come from a place of kindness and compassion rather than addiction to satisfying the body's and mind's demands. The fear-based survival mentality through a process of long-term meditative engage engagement gradually becomes a more and more natural response of caring about pain rather than hating it. About caring about each other rather than hating those who we see as being in our way. This kind of wisdom seems... Um, rare in this world. And again, I feel that it is rare uh, because it's rare to be willing to do this work of changing our relationship to our own minds, of breaking our addiction to thinking about life rather than living life. Breaking our addiction to this confusion that says, I'll be happy when I get the attention, the relationship, the promotion. When I invade this country, then I'll be happy. When I corporate take over this small town, then I'll be happy. So those are the gross examples that we see as a global dilemma. But those roots, the seeds, the subtle levels of all of that internal craving, aversion, and confusion lies within every single unenlightened human being, each one of us. This is the norm according to Buddha, according to Buddhism, here in samsara. Samsara being the Buddhist term for this earth, this human and animal realm of existence. The Buddha at one point said, mostly all we see, all we human beings sees, uh, see are two, uh, two of the six realms that are present here with our eyes. Mostly we just see the human realm and the animal realm. I said, but there's these unseen realms, which to me, when I hear about these realms, they sound more like psychological states of mind than of actual destinations or places or being. He talks about hungry ghosts. He talks about a whole realm of beings that are living in this addiction-like mentality where there is never enough, where satisfaction is impossible. When I hear the descriptions of the hungry ghost realm, sometimes the hungry ghosts in the Tibetan art or in some of the different Thai or Burmese artist representations of, uh, of Buddhist art and uh, hungry ghost realms, they're represented as these very large beings with very large being with very large bodies and the kind of normal sized heads but pin hole like a, a piece a straw like throat and a pinhole mouth surrounded by abundance there's plenty of food and everything there at the hungry ghost's disposal 
but they're just not able to get it in. They live in a perpetual state of suffering and dissatisfaction because of the craving and the inability to satisfy that craving. When I hear these descriptions, it sounds a lot like human beings to me. It sounds more like this global situation that we live in where there's more than enough resources. There's more than enough food to feed everyone. But still, over 50,000 children starve to death every single day. Every single day. And it's not because there's not enough. It's because there's so much greed, hatred, and confusion here that we human beings don't let the resources get to where they need to be. This addiction to power. The Buddha talks about the jealous gods' realms, this mentality, this state of where people are, again, kind of normal human-like beings that have everything that they need and they can get it all. They can have the food, they have regular mouths and digestion systems and everything is there at their disposal in the hungry, in the jealous gods' realms. Everything is there. But still, it's not enough. It's said in this iconography, in this cosmology, that there's a tree that grows in the hungry gods' realms. And that, like, if this room, you know, if this is our realm, but that the fruit of that tree blossoms up above in the next realm, in the heaven realm. And the jealous gods are so pissed. They got everything they need, lacking nothing but they don't get what's on that tree. And they spend their whole lives waging war against those who seemingly have more than them. Again, a state of this perpetual greed for that which isn't present. It sounds very much like uh, modern Western culture to me. More than enough, but we need more. And it's not even that we can't be satisfied, we just won't allow ourselves to. Jealous. The grass is greener phenomena. It's fine here, the grass is green, but it just looks a tinge greener over there. And I won't be happy until I get what you have. It seems like the roots of just about every war, just about every invasion of every country in the world history. Supposedly, our human realm here in samsara is supposed to be balanced. The human beings have the right amount of sorrow and joy. Not 100% joy. Not 100% sorrow. 100% pain and suffering and sorrow is talked about as a hell type of mentality, a hell realm. And then there's the ghosts, and then there's... Uh, animal realms and then there's humans and then there's jealous gods and then heaven realms also really I hear all of these teachings and I ask you to hear all of these teachings not as mythical mystical realms of existence but as mentality as psychological mind states you know what it feels like to be a hungry ghost you just can't get enough I do. I smoked crack every day for a couple of years. Hungry ghost. Couldn't get enough. You know what it feels like to be in hell? When the pain is just so overwhelming that it feels like compassion is impossible? Because you're just so overwhelmed with your own grief, your own pain? The human realm is supposed to be balanced. 
if we've actually taken birth as a human being and not a ghost or a hell being or a jealous God. We're supposed to have a balance here where it's like, yeah, there's some sorrow. There's some grief. We live in an impermanent realm here in some sorrow. Things are constantly changing, so our loved ones are constantly dying. Every experience that we have is being torn away from us. Nothing lasts, is the core teaching here. Nothing lasts. Which really fucking sucks when it's pleasurable, right? When it's really good, it's not going to last. It's really, really great when it's painful. Impermanence is the good news. It's the liberating news when life is really difficult. It's not going to last. It will pass also. So in the human realm, because of this impermanence, we're supposed to have this perfect balance of joy and sorrow, of pleasure and pain. The Chinese Buddhists talk about the human realm being 10,000 joys, 10,000 sorrows. Really, that is uh, almost, for me, that feels like an enlightened perspective. 10,000 joys, 10,000 sorrows. I think most of us, because of our craving, because of our addiction, because of our confusion, create way more sorrow in our lives in this world than we do joy. Because I know you've seen this in your own life. And I know I'm on some level preaching to the converted here. But that even our joys, we turn into sorrow. Even the wonderful, pleasurable experiences in this lifetime, we turn them into sorrow. Because they don't last, and as soon as they're gone, we're in grief. We're in sorrow. Because we're clinging. And in the human realm, in any realm in samsara, any amount of clinging equals the equal amount of suffering. <coughs> Get that? Any amount of attachment generates an equal amount of suffering. And the image that I like to use, that I see so clearly, is that if we hold on to something that is impermanent, that is being pulled beyond our grasp, whether that's an experience within our own mind-body process, or it's a relationship, or it's a... Uh, bowl of ice cream, whatever it is, if we cling to it, it's getting pulled beyond our grasp. We can't hold on to it. It's impermanent in nature. Everything is. We're left with the rope burns. Right? We're left with the fingernails down the chalkboard of trying to hold on to something that is impossible to hold on to. and the requisite dukkha, as the Buddha put it. Suffering, dissatisfaction, unnecessary difficulty. Then we turn the joy into sorrow. So then not only do we have the given pleasure and pain, we have the suffering that we create on top of it. Even around pleasure. Even around love we can suffer, right? get that one, right? Love's not supposed to be suffering. It's supposed to be joyous. But if we relate to it with this addiction to needing it to be a certain way, then even loving relationships become sorrowful suffering. If we try to be in control. Buddha talks about um, this human realm as being the ideal place, the ideal circumstances and environment for 
spiritual awakening, for this radical proposal of breaking the addiction to our minds, to pleasure and pain, and the misidentification with self, with selfishness, with self-centeredness. He says, this is the ideal realm. In hell, it's too painful to meditate. It's so painful. It's too painful in hell when you're in that hell type of mentality to really uh, generate compassion, even though that's when it's most needed, it's most difficult. And the jealous gods, you know, when you're stuck in that mentality of, of jealousy and craving and warring on your neighbors, so focused in that war zone, hard to meditate. In the animal realms, it's sort of talked about that animal-like mentality where you're just you know, really addicted to your mind, really doing whatever your mind tells you to do. Eat, sleep, kill. Eat. But in the human realm, we're supposed to have the right balance. It's supposed to be ideal for doing the very hard work of training ourselves, training our mind and body to respond differently, to relate differently to pleasure and pain. To relate differently to this imagined self, to this tendency towards self-centeredness. That here we have the opportunity. Now I know for myself, looking at this uh, cosmology that I'm putting out there, that I've incarnated in this lifetime through many different realms. And even moment to moment, Find those moments where I'm back in the hungry ghost realm, those moments where I'm lost in the jealousy realm. But that the balance is the human realm. The Dharma, the Buddha's teachings, is mostly aimed at human beings. Mostly aimed at human beings, at those in balance. Now, I don't want to get too far into this, although maybe we will in the Q&A. I would say that there are other teachings that are more suitable for those who are completely lost in hungry ghost type of addiction realms. More suitable than the Buddha's Dharma, I would say, for the hungry ghost realm is the 12 steps. My experience is even though the 12 Steps, 12 Steps is a much more Western-oriented, theistic type of spiritual practice, that it was more suitable of a teaching for hungry ghosts than non-attachment and compassionate Buddhist teachings are for hungry ghosts. You hear what I'm saying? Does this make sense? It's a totally different teaching. The Buddha's Dharma doesn't work so well for some of these different realms. The Buddha said this himself. He said that my teachings will be most accessible by human beings. Not by ghost realm. Not by hell realms. Not by jealous gods. Not by those in this constant pleasure of heaven realms. But by human beings who have the appropriate balance of joy and sorrow of pleasure and pain. My experience was the 12 steps in many ways, along with some mindfulness meditation, allowed me to come out of the hungry ghost mentality, to break that physical addiction to substances, to treat it, to the point where I could begin the Dharma practice in a deep way to begin breaking the addiction to my mind. Very few have been able to substitute the Dharma for a 12-step oriented recovery. Very few. Some. Maybe some people in this room. But it hasn't worked well for many over the 20 years that I've been uh, walking in both of these worlds.
worlds of recovery and Buddhism. Even the 12 steps, how many people here want to admit they're in recovery? Some of us, not a, not a, not a lot. Um, even the 12 steps are so brilliant. First, the first 10, clear away the wreckage of your past, do the psychological and spiritual practices of praying and inventories, do all of that work first. Then, go deep into meditation. The 11th step, you're almost at the end of the process before meditation is encouraged. The 11th step. I think the Buddha was right there with, with you know, or Bill and Bob were right there with the Buddha. You know, knowing that there was a lot of work necessary to be done for hungry ghost type addicts. before delving into seeing, you know, improving conscious contact, consciousness, awakening. After the Buddha's enlightenment, he was hesitant to teach the Dharma. He felt, and he was wrong. Actually, the Buddha, and this is important. I'm, so I'm a Buddhist, I guess. I'm a, sort of a hesitant Buddhist. I've been practicing for about 20 years now. I teach it, but I don't really like the label that much. The Buddha was wrong about several things according to the original scriptures. He was wrong about several things. He was right about a lot of shit. <clears throat> he said after his enlightenment that he felt uh, that the Dharma was too subtle and too profound. Too profound but too subtle for human beings to get. He didn't think that there would be many, if any, humans that would really take to the, the teachings, the Dharma, the truth that he had experienced for himself. His initial thought was, this world is too fucked up. The dark side is too strong. When I say that, I mean the greed, the hatred, the delusion, the survival-based addiction to pleasure is too strong for people to break it. He was wrong about that. He, was, he reflected on it for a while and was later convinced, I'm wrong about that, and began to teach. But even in his teaching, he, he um, prophesied. He thought, only a few beings in every generation, only a small amount of human beings will be willing to do this very difficult work. Because again, it, what we're being asked to do is counter to our very natural survival mechanism of craving and attachment and aversion. We're being asked to defy the norm, the normal human mentality. We're being asked to defy the mind. And the mind's confused tendencies and how that confused personal tendency has become all of these cultural norms, societal conditioning. He said, it's such a radical proposal. I'll be surprised if many are really willing to get serious about it. And one of the perhaps most radical things that I, I think is that the Buddha is saying, enlightenment is possible for everyone, possible for everyone, for anyone, but that it's very hard work so I doubt very many people are going to be willing to do hard work. 
people are lazy, they're going with the flow, going with the, you know, downstream, chasing the next pleasure, avoiding the next pain, swept up in the culture's karma conditioning. And one of the things that I think is so radical, <clears throat> especially 2,500 years ago in, in his culture, and I think it's very pertinent now, is that he's offering an enlightenment that is not a state of bliss all of the time. Just about every other tradition, especially the Hindu tradition that he's rejecting, says enlightenment is bliss all of the time. Heaven Happiness all of the time. Happily ever after. Feeding right in with the normal human craving for pleasure. Just about every proposition and even later uh, perspectives on enlightenment have become like enlightenment means heavenly happiness all of the time. That's not what the Buddha was teaching. It's one of the reasons why he said people aren't going to want what I have to offer. I'm only offering freedom from suffering. That's all. Not freedom from pain. Not constant bliss. The nirvana that the Buddha experienced was a simple and radical breaking of the addiction with the mind so that we never create suffering for ourselves. So that we break our craving to clinging to pleasure, our hatred of pain, and we begin to meet pain with compassion. It does not mean the pain goes away. Enlightened beings, the Buddha himself, was very clear about the pain that he continued to experience. And I think that's one of the reasons why he's like, who's going to buy this? Who's going to sign up for just not suffering? Everybody, create human craving. We want to turn it into, it's going to feel good all of the time. As long as you have a human mind and a body, you're not going to feel good all of the time. It's completely unrealistic. It's a fantasy. It's more delusional, magical thinking. It is not the teaching of the Buddha. I am clear about that. I mean, what the fuck do I know? But in my somewhat deep study of Buddhism over these last many, many years, this seems central and core and true. Although you'll find a hundred Buddhist teachers that will tell you, oh, nirvana is bliss all of the time. My feeling is that they're wrong that that is not the teaching of the Buddha. Nirvana is freedom from suffering, not freedom from pain, not constant bliss, not constant joy, but a radical transformation in how we relate to the pain and the pleasure that is a given, to the grief that is inevitable, in this impermanent human realm. Which for me, I love it. It's because it's realistic. Because it feels attainable. Because it's not another fantasy. It's not another happy ending Hollywood love story spirituality happily ever after my ass. <laughs> but the reality of actually what happens is that we lose everyone. hurts no matter what.
there's a place in the suttas that uh, Moggallana is just died. Moggallana is one of the Buddha's chief disciples. He had uh, been practicing with Siddhartha Gautama before Sid's awakening, before he became the Buddha. They'd been off, you know, torturing themselves in the forest for a few years in their ascetic confusion. And then they lived, you know, and then they both got enlightened, you know, as these stories go. And they lived together as sort of spiritual friends, partners, Sangha community for like almost 50 years. And there's a place in the suttas where Moggallana dies, and the Buddha says it feels like the sun has been extinguished. even feeling, you know, this real grief right now. Accepting it as just as it is. It's just grief. It doesn't have to be suffering. If we try to push it away, if we try to deny it, if we try to medicate it, avoid it, we'll create some real problems for ourselves. But that grief is a given no matter how awakened we become. Because we live in this realm where everything is constantly dying. Of course, that's true on this physical realm where our loved ones die, where people are being murdered and oppressed. Each moment, people are dying. And it's also true just on the uh, impermanent realm of every experience is dying. I was sitting uh, in the rain in the hot tub at my hotel this afternoon. It was very pleasurable. And I could get attached to that kind of pleasure. And that experience is dead. And if I'm attached to it, I'll suffer about it. But if we can learn to just enjoy the pleasure that presents itself, that, those fleeting, wonderful experiences, and if we can learn to accept this grief when it comes, to meet it with kindness and acceptance, rather than hatred and aversion and avoidance, Even if you notice perhaps your own discomfort with my display of emotion. Not all of you, but maybe some of you notice that, like, oh, I don't want to see someone grieving, feeling sadness, acknowledging the truth of this difficulty. It's, you know, there is that some, something in us. We don't like it. We don't like our own pain. We don't like other people's pain either. We don't want to see that shit. I came to hear about bliss. <laughs> These are some of my thoughts about Buddhist path, about the Buddha's teachings. More specifically, in order to break our addictions, in order to transform our relationship to the mind and body that craves and rejects, a disciplined practice of meditation is necessary. Mostly, the Buddha offered the four foundations of mindfulness as the path of transformative meditative training. 
He offered lots of different meditation practices to lots of different people depending on the circumstances and the ways that they were causing suffering for themselves or others. Sometimes he said, you just do compassion practice. Sometimes he said, you just loving kindness. You need to learn about forgiveness very clearly, you know, uh, individual basis. But the most prescribed meditative training that he gave to the monks and nuns that studied with him, that he offered to the uh, business people and the townspeople that came to visit him. First of all, he taught everyone about the importance of generosity before he taught meditation. People came to hear the Buddha. He said, learn how to share what you have with each other. Stop being so fucking selfish. Learn the importance of generosity, of sharing, of giving, of sharing our life's energy and our resources with each other. Not a hypothetical suggestion, but a practical one. He said, you know, share a little bit of each meal with someone who is hungry. You know, in India, that's not hypothetical. Here, probably not so hypothetical either. In this global situation, with all of the death and starvation that's going on, not hypothetical, real, generosity, get involved, be of service. First, that's a prerequisite. Learn to give. But if you really want to change your relationship to your mind, he starts with the four foundations. He says, learn to Pay attention to the present moment. And this is huge, present time awareness. And we'll do some here in a minute. We'll, we'll do some meditation together. But to go over the, the four foundations, uh, theoretically first for a moment. The Buddha begins with breath awareness. Now many Buddhists never get beyond breath awareness, right? You th people start to think like, oh, well, meditating is paying attention to my breath. The Buddha used the breath as the foundation, as the place to start, because it's always happening. The breath, body breathes by itself. Breath comes and goes. It's a constant physical sensation, constantly in changing, but constant. So he says, learn to pay attention to the breath, to break the identification with what's happening in the mind, and bring your attention to the breath. And when your attention wanders back to thinking, bring it back to the breath. Breathing in, know that you're breathing in. Breathing out, know that you're breathing out. And be <coughs> concise about this. Concentrate on it. If the breath is deep, know it. Be mindful of the deep breath. If it's shallow, know it. Be mindful of the shallow exhale. Be precise in your attention. And this is the concentration foundation. Learn to choose what you pay attention to rather than letting the mind do whatever it wants. Train your attention on the body. Let the mind be in the background. This is the foundation, the first foundation. It talks about breath awareness, body awareness. It talks about death awareness. Right in the first meditation instruction. And the first foundation of mindfulness. He says, get really familiar with the inevitable fact of death. Don't let it catch you off guard. Make friends with it. Be clear that that's what happens to these human bodies. Break your denial about death. Reflect on it on a daily basis. And in those initial meditative training stages, he sends people into the graveyards, into the charnel grounds. He says, go meditate on the truth of impermanence. That just as those bodies that are being burned uh, and decaying in these many different stages of decay, that reflect that that's also true for your body. Find a refuge that is beyond this physical body. Find an understanding that your existence, your karmic momentum continues without the physical body. Realize that death is inevitable. One way he puts it, he says, 
death is certain. The time of death is uncertain. So be prepared. Be prepared to die. Be prepared to die. Right there in the first mindfulness teachings. Now, I don't know how many people here do meditation, do Buddhism. My experience is that very few, you know, that you'll find like oh, there'll be this death retreat or whatever. But very few teachers, when they're teaching you how to meditate, encourage you right in the beginning to reflect on death. And even I'm guilty of that, I think, as a, as a meditation teacher. We stick with the mindfulness, we stick with the loving kindness and the compassion. But Originally, the Buddha was saying, as you learn to be mindful of your breath and body, also learn to be mindful of death, to reflect on it, to accept it. In the first foundation, he also says, bring awareness to the truth that this body and mind are just the four elements. See clearly for yourself that there's nothing really going on here except for the earth element and water and heat and what and uh, breath. See that directly. Four elements inside, outside. That's all that's really true is four elements. Temporarily constituting this living body and then also constituting everything else in existence for elements. In the second foundation, after training our attention to be present with the here and now, which is radical in itself, the Buddha said the, uh, the, the untrained mind is like a monkey swinging from branch to branch to branch. That the monkey mind is just honoring curious George getting into all kinds of trouble that the first foundation of mindfulness is taming the monkey mind is training ourselves our minds to pay attention to the present and if you meditate you know it doesn't do it right you say pay attention to the breath your mind says fuck you I'm gonna make plans <laughs> <laughs> I've got memories to reminisce about. I've got plans to make. And you say, hey, come back over here. And then your mind does what it wants. And come back over here. And the monkey mind does whatever it wants. And so it's a really engaged process of training ourselves to pay attention, to training this mind to land in the present moment and to stay there for a little while before wandering off again. The second foundation is um, a lot of what I was talking about, which is where once we're here in the present moment, the Buddha encourages us, begin to see that in the present moment, and you can only see this in the present moment, that every phenomena that meets your consciousness, every experience, physical, emotional, uh, psychological, Every experience at all of the sense doors, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting. Every experience has a feeling tone of being either pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. Every single experience is either pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. When you're mindful, when we are paying attention, we see that clearly. <coughs> And our habitual reactive tendency is, when it's pleasant, cling, crave, try to hold on to it. And when it's unpleasant, push it away, ignore it, get rid of it. And if it's neutral, usually we ignore it too. Now this is just boring, neutral. And then we start craving for pleasure. Start trying to create pleasure. Start planning, right? That's what happens. The mind says, well, what's for dinner? I'm hungry. I hope it's delicious, whatever it is. 
Second foundation, feeling tone. And this is mostly what I've been talking about so far, our relationship to pleasure and pain. If we're not present, we don't get to see our relationship to pleasure and pain, and we continue to float downstream with the rest of humanity in craving and in aversion, in greed and hatred and delusion. So first mindfulness, then investigating, does it feel good or bad? How am I relating to that, that which I'm experiencing? And it's there where we begin to have free will. On some level, I would say without mindfulness, we have no free will at all. We only have an illusion of free will. But we're just going to do what we're wired to do, which is chase pleasure, avoid pain. With mindfulness, we can begin to accept pain, not avoid it, not hate it, not create suffering for ourselves around it, but to actually learn to first tolerate pain, accept pain, and then to begin to uncover compassion and mercy and forgiveness towards pain, towards that pain of the past and the present. But we have to be mindful first. We have to be present in order to see it and to respond rather than the old habitual reactions. The norm. The status quo. And from that place, we begin to free ourselves from suffering. It's just pleasure. It's just pain. I don't have to suffer about it. I don't have to meet it with these unskillful tendencies that make life way more difficult than they need to be. From the second foundation, the Buddha then goes on to the mindfulness of the mind itself. Breaking our addiction to pleasure and pain, he says, now time to break your addiction to the mind itself. Third foundation of mindfulness is bringing attention to the process of the mind. That all thoughts are impermanent impersonal on some level. This transformation that happens from taking everything that happens inside of your mind personally, my mind, you meditate for a while, you begin to see clearly, you're not in control of your mind. Your mind has a mind of its own. It's fucking anarchy in there. You think you're in control of your mind? Make it stop. <laughs> Make it stop judging you so much. Make it stop judging others so much. You don't have that ability just because you choose.